What's going on? In this video, I'm going to be comparing three different cinema cameras that are each under $500. And I'm going to figure out what the best real cinema camera for under $500 is. Now, it's really hard to find a real proper cinema camera for under $500. And because of that, I believe this is pretty much the first YouTube video about this. But it was definitely a struggle finding three real cinema cameras for this price. So the three cinema cameras I'm going to be comparing in this video are the Sony FX100, the Zcam E1, and the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera Original. Now, two of these cameras, the FS100 and the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera, are true cinema cameras, you know, you really can't debate that. They're real, dedicated cinema cameras. But the Zcam E1 is a little bit debatable if it's a true cinema camera or not. But after some debating, I decided to include it because Zcam is pretty much a cinema camera company. And the features included in this camera are pretty cinema camera oriented. However, I understand that it might not be a specific cinema camera. But also finding three cinema cameras is very difficult for this. And I didn't want to do just a 1v1 comparison between the FS100 and the Blackmagic. So either way, after some contemplating, I decided to include the Zcam. And some of the results definitely might surprise you with this camera. And honestly, with all these cameras, so definitely stay tuned. Now before we get into this, this is going to be a pretty long and in-depth video. And there's also going to be a lot of jumping around. I worked on this video for the past few months and I filmed it over like a week and a half. But basically this video took a huge amount of time and energy and money to make. But I really hope it helps you out if you're looking into this budget. I'm sure there's a lot of people that want to get into filmmaking and have a $500 budget. And there's really not very many resources on the internet. So I really, really hope this video helps you out. And if you want to support me, definitely feel free to go down, hit the like button, subscribe, and leave a comment on this video. That would really help me out and it's all free. So now that we got all that out of the way, let's just get right into this video. So each one of these cameras has their own like specific defining feature that only that specific camera has out of these three. And so the, for the FS100 it has XLR inputs and really in-depth audio controls. The Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera shoots in RAW and has very, very strong video codecs. And the Zcam E1 is the only one of these that shoots in 4K. And sort of off the bat, you can obviously see the visual differences between these. The FS100 is obviously the biggest camera. It has its own dedicated side grip. It has its own dedicated microphone mount and overall, it's just a large camera. But besides that, especially with their own defining features, it's really not super clear right off the bat which one's the best option for filmmaking and for just getting into video work. So they're all kind of getting older now. There's really not a whole lot of news or videos or anything on the internet about these. So hopefully this video clears that up for you and I will choose a winner at the end of this video. Please don't just skip to the end, but I just wanna let you know right off the bat. At the end, I will tell you which one I would recommend buying. So I'm gonna start off with introductions of each of these three cameras and just talk about the main features of these and just a rundown of each of these cameras. First things first, the Sony FS100. So this is of course a Sony camera. It was released in 2011. This camera has a super 35 millimeter sensor with a 1.5 times crop and it has Sony's E-mount. So of course the E-mount is a super flexible lens mount. You can adapt Canon EF lenses, Nikon lenses, as well as basically any sort of vintage lens to this mount because of its short flange distance. Now this was Sony's entry level cinema camera in their lineup when it was released. It was basically Sony's direct competitor to the Canon C100. And this camera records up to 1080p video at 60 frames a second, as well as 30 and 24 frames a second in 1080p. So when this camera was released in 2011, it costed $5,000. However, now you can pretty easily find it on the used market for between $450 and $650. Next up, we have this tiny camera right here, the Zcam E1. So this camera was released in 2016. I believe it was Zcam's first camera. Of course, if you know Zcam, they make a lot of fantastic cinema cameras now, obviously at much higher price points, but this is basically their introduction into the camera world. So this has a micro four thirds mount as well as a micro four thirds sensor with a two times crop factor. Now, obviously you can see that this thing is absolutely tiny. It's the world's smallest 4K interchangeable lens camera, which depending on your case could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. But this camera can shoot up to DCI 4K at 24 frames a second. And it can also record Ultra HD 4K, I believe up to 30 frames a second, 1080p up to 60 frames a second, and then 720p at 240 frames a second. So if you need 240 frames a second, this is the only option. However, it does it in 720p and it's really not good quality, but it's still a feature of this camera and it's still in there if you need it. 
Now I'm gonna go more in depth on the bodies and features and everything of these cameras later on in this video. This is just an introduction into pricing and into the cameras themselves. So just keep that in mind. Like I said, this is gonna be a very in-depth, very long video. I'll have timestamps down in the description. So this camera, when it was released, costed $700. However, now you can find it used on eBay for between $250 and $350. And you can even find it new in some places for $400. I believe they dropped the price to that and it's just kind of stuck at that for the new price. But I found a pretty good deal on this. I got it used for under 250 bucks. So this is by far the cheapest camera out of these three. And last but not least, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera Original. This camera was released in 2013, so it's kind of the middle ground age of these cameras. It's right between the Z Cam and the FS100. Now this camera has a micro four thirds mount, but it has a Super 16 sensor. So it's gonna have the same mount as the Z Cam, but this sensor has a 2.88 times crop factor. So this is gonna be the highest crop factor. So if you shoot telephoto lenses, it'll be the best. But if you want to get wide angles and shoot with wide lenses, it'll definitely be the worst option. But there's a bunch of workarounds and depending on what camera you decide to go with, you can do more research and figure out the best options for lenses and whatnot. So when this camera was released, it costed $1,000, but you can find this used for between $400 and $600 now. And so that's it for the introduction and the pricing of these three cameras. Now let's move on to the video specs. So to start things off, the Sony FS100. And so this camera shoots 1080p video at 24, 30, and 60 frames a second. And so it records that in AVCHD, H.264, and 4208 bit. So there's really nothing special when it comes to the codecs with this. It's just regular 1080p up to 60 frames a second and a 4208 bit codec. And 24 frames a second is gonna be about 24 megabytes per second. So this camera really doesn't have any sort of special cinema camera codecs or anything. It's pretty much a standard 1080p video. However, it does have multiple picture profiles you can customize to get the highest dynamic range or the best look straight out of the camera. It's very, very customizable in this sense, which is great. And that's definitely a cinema camera style feature built into this. This camera has a maximum of 11.5 stops of dynamic range. It records the standard SD cards and it has one SD card slot, but it also has Sony's proprietary SSD media. I wouldn't even recommend looking into this. They're very overpriced and it's kind of like a proprietary thing. You can't use any sort of standard SSDs or anything like that. You have to buy these specific Sony ones, which you can't buy new anymore either. You have to search for them on eBay and they're much higher priced than SD cards and they don't really offer anything special. So long story short, I'd recommend just using SD cards, but there is an option to use their proprietary media. And last but not least, this camera has a base ISO of 500. Now we're gonna get more into the ISO and low light performance later on in this video as well, as well as of course, specific video comparisons and tests between these to show dynamic range and sharpness and how the codecs hold up and all that sort of stuff. Next up for video specs we have the Zcam E1 and this camera records 4k DCI video up to 24 frames a second. The DCI aspect ratio is really nice and wide and makes it look a lot more cinematic and it gives you those extra pixels and the width you can use to adjust your framing if you do want to export in a 16 by 9 format. Now this also shoots Ultra HD 4k at up to 30 frames a second as well as 24 frames a second, 1080p at up to 60 frames a a second and then of course 720p at 240 frames a second. Now it records all these in an H.264 4208 bit codec. So again, nothing special with the codecs, but being able to shoot in 4K will provide a much sharper image and downscaling to 1080p will compress the noise and it'll hypothetically give you a much cleaner image. But of course, we're gonna have to look at it through testing, but hypothetically, this will provide the cleanest image as well as the highest resolution. Now 24 frames a second in DCI 4K with this camera records it in 60 megabytes a second. So for 4K video, that's actually a pretty low bit rate. However, it's more than double the bitrate of the Sony FS100. Now this camera has a maximum of 10 stops of dynamic range. So again, it's lower dynamic range than the FS100 as well by about one and a half stops. Now the Zcam E1 records all of its video to micro SD cards. And last but not least, this camera has a base ISO of 100. All right, so next up in terms of video specs, we have the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. It records 1080p video in 24 or 30 frames a second. It doesn't record any high resolution or any higher frame rates, just 1080p. 24 and 30 frames a second. So it's definitely the most limited in terms of frame rate and resolution. However, where this camera really shines over the rest of these is with the video codecs. So you can record this 1080p video in either ProRes or in RAW. And so in ProRes, you can record ProRes Proxy, ProRes LT, ProRes 422 or ProRes 422 HQ. And every single one of these are gonna be a 10-bit 422 codec, which will provide a huge amount of flexibility for color grading without breaking down or anything like that, like an 8-bit 420 codec would. But then it also shoots in Cinema DNG RAW 
which is a 12-bit raw codec, which provides an insane amount of flexibility for changing your ISO in post, changing your exposures, changing your white balance. Raw is basically the best video quality you can get with any camera, and the fact that this shoes raw for this price point is insane. However, I want to be upfront, all of the footage that I shot with this camera for this video is in ProRes 422HQ. So this is the highest non-raw codec you can shoot with this camera, and 24 frames a second footage with ProRes 422HQ is about 176 megabytes per second. So this still records a huge amount of data and has a huge amount of flexibility, however it's much easier to work with than RAW. And the best part is this records all this to regular SD cards. So you don't need an external SSD or like a RAW recorder or anything like that. Now I think the only reason it's able to do that is because it only shoots in 1080p. If it shot in 4K, you would definitely need some form of faster media, which would be way more expensive. So I think it's awesome that I can do that on just SD cards built into this camera. And last but not least, this has a base ISO of 800. Next up, I'm going to talk about the camera bodies, the features, the ergonomics, and the form factor of these cameras in general. So like always, I'm going to start out with the Sony FS100. So this camera has kind of a weird form factor. It's pretty much like a big block or a brick with a bunch of buttons and dials on one side, a handle on the other side, and then a bunch more dials and buttons on the top with a little flip out screen, but basically just a box covered with dozens of buttons and dials and switches and everything like that. So first of all, this takes Sony NPF batteries. These batteries have been around forever at this point. They're super high capacity. You can get a bunch of different sizes, a bunch of different types. You can get some with like USB ports on them. Basically, there's just a bunch of different types of these batteries and they're just so well known at this point that they're really compatible with pretty much everything. I mean, external monitors use them. The lights I'm using to light this use them. So basically, these batteries are well known. They're high capacity and they're just really good in general. This camera also has a three and a half inch articulating touch screen. So basically it flips down on top here and then you can flip it up. So you know you can look at it like this. You can flip it around 180 degrees if you're filming yourself. And then you can also flip it back down facing straight up. So it's just flat against the body still. So you can pretty much rotate that any direction you need. It's kind of like the articulating screens on like mirrorless cameras where you can basically see it no matter what direction the camera is. That's super nice. And like I mentioned, it's touchscreen as well. It's not a super intuitive touchscreen, but you can use it for some functions. And honestly, I don't find myself ever using the touchscreen, but it's there if you want to use it, which is super nice. Next up on the side of the camera, we have a bunch of different buttons and dials, and these make it super easy to change basically any setting you need whenever you need to. And so you can just look at these and just see what's on here. I mean, there's focus buttons to change from manual to autofocus. You can adjust the white balance. You can adjust the ISO, zebra, focus peaking, histogram. There's just a bunch of stuff on the side that makes it super easy to change any settings you need to on the go without having to dive into the menus. And then on top under the screen, there's even more. These are mostly for like audio gain controls, playback controls, and then like controls for going through the menu as well as of course the power switch and start and stop record button. And then moving on to ports, this camera has two XLR inputs, a headphone output jack, a control port for the side grip to start and stop recording. It has a USB port, it has component out as well as AV out, which is super interesting. It kind of shows how old school this camera is, but also has an HDMI output. And this is a clean HDMI output, which means you can send this out to an external recorder or like to a computer for a webcam or whatever you need. It's a clean HDMI output, which is super nice. Now actually all three of these cameras have clean HDMI outputs, so it's super awesome if you want to use these for webcams or with an external recorder without having to bake in all the settings and stuff that's usually on the menus. And that's pretty much it. I mean, you can see the form factor of this. You know, it's definitely an interesting form factor, but probably the most ergonomic out of all of these, even though it's pretty much just a big box. I mean, this camera is just definitely the best for just ease of use, for changing settings, for adjusting stuff, dialing and exposures and focus and all that. This camera is great. So next up, the Zcam E1. This one's pretty quick and simple. It's this tiny little like action camera shaped camera. There's five buttons on the back, a mode button, function button, which you can set to a couple different settings, up down arrows and a menu, as well as the power button on the front and record button on top. And that's the only buttons this thing has. So to change almost any settings, you have to go into the menus there's not a touch screen either, it's just a two and a half inch LCD screen. So you have to go into the menus, press these up and down arrows, figure out which direction is which, you know, scroll through stuff, press enter, scroll through more. It's not fun and it takes a long time to change anything with this. Like literally even changing your ISO or your shutter speed or your white balance. It just takes way too much time and it's really not very fun to use. Now besides that, there's of course the three and a half millimeter microphone input. There's a micro USB a five volt DC input, which is super cool, a mini HDMI, so it's not micro HDMI, which would have really sucked because micro HDMI is the worst. Mini HDMI, 
It's not super bad. It's still a really small, easily breakable port, but it's better than micro HDMI. Then also has an IO jack. Um, honestly, I'm not sure exactly what this is used for, but it's there if you need it. And that's basically it. Like I said, this thing has really bad ergonomics. There's no grip to hold it. There's really no easy way to hold this thing. The next up, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. So this has a three and a half inch LCD screen. It's not a touch screen either, which also kind of sucks, but it does have more buttons. So on the top, you have your record button, your playback controls, then on the back you have your iris button, focus button, up, down, left, right arrows, an okay button, menu, and then a power button. And so that's all the buttons on this. It's still kind of a lot of messing through menus and just, you know, clicking through stuff, enter, back, click down, 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 over, you know, all that sort of stuff. However, the good thing about this is really not a whole lot of settings you can change in the first place. So for the most part, you kind of set stuff how you need it and then just go from there. So it's definitely better to use than the Z cam but nothing compared to the FS100. You still have to go into the menus to change all the stuff. And then when it comes to ports on this, there's five ports. So there's a 12 volt input so you can run an external battery, which you're definitely gonna need because this battery barely lasts any time at all. Like it's terrible. So you pretty much need to run an external battery with this. It has a micro HDMI, which sucks. This is so easy to break, but of course it's clean HDMI output. If you treat it well and don't bump it at all, it'll still work great. Then you have a three and a half millimeter mic input, three and a half millimeter headphone output, as well as a remote cable. So you can basically have a remote start and stop function for this. Like I said, the battery's terrible on this. You really need to use that 12 volt input and use a dummy battery or an external battery solution. But this also has a small grip. It's kind of like a mirrorless camera. So it has this little grip right here that you can hold on to, but it's just just really not good. I mean, it's not very deep. It's kind of hard to hold like this. You're honestly best off building this into a rig as well, which kind of defeats the purpose of its pocket cinema camera status. But if you're not having this on a tripod or like mounted to something, you probably want to build out a rig and have like some sort of other handle to hold on to. All right, next up, video assist features. So this will be a pretty quick segment. I just wanna talk about the assist features you get with each of these cameras because all of them are a little bit different and having the extra assist like focus peaking, focus magnification and stuff like that is really useful for recording video. So the Sony FS100 has focus peaking, it has focus zoom assist, where you can crop into the image to check focus on a specific spot. It also has zebras as well as a histogram. And a lot of these can be turned on and off with just buttons on the side of the camera and overall has pretty good assist features for checking things like your exposure and focus. Now the Zcam E1 has none of this and also has the smallest screen, which makes it the most difficult for checking focus and exposure and framing and everything like that. So this camera only has a zoom in focus assist. You can assign a button in the menu to essentially crop in to check your focus, but there's no histogram, there's no focus peaking, there's no zebras, there's nothing like that. So it's very hard to tell if you're in focus, if you're exposed correctly or anything like that with this camera. And next up, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. This has focus peaking as well as a histogram and zebras. You can't crop in to check focus, which kind of sucks because all these kind of have small screens on them. However, focus peaking is a big help and having a histogram and zebras are also great for checking your exposure. Next up is ISO performance. So for the Sony FS100, up to 1600 ISO looks pretty clean. Of course, it's gonna be the best at its native ISO of 500, but I was honestly surprised that up to 1600 ISO looks pretty clean and even up to 3200 ISO with some light noise reduction is pretty usable. For the Zcam E1, 100 ISO is definitely the cleanest. 200 is a little bit more noise, but I would still say it's fairly clean and then anything above that doesn't look good. A bunch of noise gets added in and it just doesn't look good at all. Next up for the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera, anywhere from 200 to 800 look really good. And even 1600 isn't terrible with a little bit of noise reduction. Try to stick to 800, which is native ISO if you can. So when it comes to ISO performance and low light performance, the FS100 is definitely the winner at getting fairly usable images up to 3200 ISO. The Zcam E1 is just terrible. You can only go up to 200 and even at 200, you can definitely see some noise coming into play. And then the Blackmagic only goes up to 1600 as it is. You can't even go higher than that, but there's a little bit of noise coming in at 1600. So 800 is probably where you want to stay to get the best image possible. Next up, we have autofocus. This will be a pretty quick category as well. 
because none of these cameras have very reliable autofocus at all. And honestly, for any sort of professional work or anything that's important to record, I wouldn't trust the autofocus with any of these. Now that's understandable because all of these are pretty old and old technology autofocus is not very good in the first place. However, I'll post some examples on screen of how fast it is. I would say if anything, the FS100 has the most reliable and the best autofocus. But again, I really wouldn't trust any of these. I can maybe trust the FS100 in a studio setting like with what I'm doing right now. But honestly, for anything important, I would just rely on manual focus. However, all of these do technically have autofocus. Next up we have rolling shutter. So this is basically like a jello-y effect that happens with most cameras that have this thing called rolling shutters. So basically with most consumer cameras, you have a sensor here and the camera basically reads the sensor from the top to the bottom. And so obviously it, can, it has to take a certain amount of time to do that. And so if you're moving sideways during that, it'll scan the top at one point, but by the time it gets to the bottom of the sensor, the camera might already be moved a little bit, and so it'll kind of look skewed and make things look warped at an angle. And this effect does not look very good, especially when you're panning really fast with some cameras. Now it's kind of a special case type of thing where you might not always notice it. And if you're doing something obviously like what I'm doing here, you would never notice any sort of rolling shutter. Even if I move my arm around really fast or do anything like that, you probably wouldn't notice it. However, when you're shooting handheld, it can sometimes just make the footage look a little jello-y and wobbly and wiggly, and it looks kind of weird. And so I attached all these cameras together and did a rolling shutter test where it basically just panned back and forth really fast. And so after doing this test, I concluded that the Sony FS100 has the best rolling shutter resistance or the lowest amount of rolling shutter. The Blackmagic Cinema Camera Original is second place and then the Z Cam is definitely last place. It has quite a bit of rolling shutter. Everything looks really warped. And honestly, all these have a little bit of rolling shutter. You can see that all of them have like an angle in that straight up line. So none of these are gonna be perfect or amazing. However, I'd say the FS100 is definitely first place when it comes to rolling shutter. And now speaking of rolling shutter and shooting handheld, all these cameras are such different form factors and of course the Z cam is so small and the FS100 is pretty big and heavy. The look out of holding these handhelds is gonna be completely different on all of these. And so I did a test basically holding these cameras, just the cameras with no accessories, no attachments, except just the lens on them. And I just held each of these cameras as steady as I could handheld to kind of see like what kind of results you can get if you don't have any sort of rig or stabilizer or tripod. And of course, after looking at the footage, the FS100 looks the smoothest because of course it's the head Heaviest. It's gonna kind of soak up those little jitters your hands have. And then the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera has a little bit of a grip on it, so you can kind of hold it like a regular like DSLR, but it was still super light and you get a lot of jitters out of it. And of course the Z Cam, there's really no good way to hold this at all. It's just a little box. And so there's not really a good way to hold it or anything like that. I just kind of had to hold it like this basically. And this definitely had the most like jittery effect because it's just so hard to hold. And it's such a light camera. So when it comes to audio with these cameras, every single one of them is completely different. So first of all, I'm actually recording with all three of these cameras right now. The Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera, the Zcam E1, and the FS100. And I'm using the built-in internal microphones on each of these cameras as well. So this will give you a little bit of an example of what the internal mics sound like if you don't have anything attached to them. However, the Sony FS100 does not have any sort of internal microphone, which kind of sucks because it also only has XLR inputs. So if you don't have an XLR mic, you literally can't get any audio, not even scratch audio from this camera. But let's fly through this before you click off because this audio probably isn't the best. So the Sony FS100 has two XLR inputs, and so this is awesome for professional audio. This camera also has a 3.5mm headphone output jack so you can monitor your audio while you're recording. However, like I said, the FS100 doesn't have a 3.5mm mic input. So you can't use something like a Rode Wireless Go or Rode Video Micro or anything like that. You have to use an XLR microphone. And this camera has a bunch of buttons and dials for adjusting input gain, headphone output volume, whether the gain's manual or automatic, you can enable 48 volt phantom power, and a bunch of other stuff. There's just a ton of dials and buttons and just physical things on the camera body for adjusting your audio. Now when it comes to the Zcam E1, this has a 3.5mm microphone input jack, so you can use a Rode Video Micro or a Rode Video Mic Go or something like that. However, there's not a single setting for adjusting any sort of input gain or wind cut filters or anything like that. There's literally no audio settings in the settings menu. So any sort of gain is going to happen internally, I assume, and it'll just adjust to whatever it thinks is best. And the Zcam E1 also doesn't have a headphone output or anything like that. So just one single input, 3.5mm mic input. 
Next up, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. This camera has a 3.5mm mic input as well as a 3.5mm headphone output. Now there's no physical buttons or dials for adjusting the gain or the volume for the headphones. However, there is a settings page in the menu for adjusting gain. And there's a fair amount of control. It's not a whole lot, but there's definitely more than like the Z Cam. I'd probably recommend getting like an XLR preamp so you can plug in a professional microphone and it'll have a much better preamp than it's built into the camera. However, nothing can beat the FS100 with its two XLR inputs, a bunch of physical dials and controls for adjusting it, as well as a headphone output. The FS100 is definitely the best option for audio. Next up, I want to go over the picture profiles I use while testing all three of these cameras. Because on each one of these cameras, you can choose a different picture profile or color profile that gives a different look straight out of the camera. So with the Sony FS100, I used a customized picture profile that's meant to look really good straight out of the camera with little to no color grading or correcting. And actually all the footage I'm going to show with this camera was just straight out of camera with this custom profile. So I'm going to put this profile up on the screen if you're interested in checking it out and seeing what it is. But it's not any sort of log or anything like that, it's just kind of a more customized Rec. 709 standard profile. But like I said, all the footage that I show with the FS100 is straight out of the camera with this custom profile. So this will give a little bit of a higher dynamic range and a little better look than no picture profile or what it would just be straight out of the camera. And so that's basically why I use this. It doesn't require very much post-production. It's just good straight out of the camera, provides a better dynamic range and just a better look. For the Zcam E1, there's two options. There's an sRGB, which is a Rec. 709 color profile. And then there's Zlog 2. And you'd usually record with a log format to get the most amount of dynamic range. You'd get the best colors out of it and it allows for the most like pushing and pulling around in post with shadows and highlights and exposure however with the z-cam this log profile just does not work with this codex and it makes the footage completely fall apart i actually go way more in depth on this in my review of this camera which i'll link down in the description if you're interested but the log profile i just would not even recommend using at all with this camera which really sucks because that's what makes this camera feel more like a cinema camera you know the log profile the 4k dci video but the fact that you can't use that log profile at all without the color completely falling apart really sucks. So with all the footage with this camera, I used just a regular Rec. 709 profile and it was all just straight out of camera, didn't do any color correcting or grading. I did notice that this footage came out a lot more warm and a lot yellower than the rest and all the white balances were set exactly the same on all these. So I just noticed that the Z cam is a lot warmer and a lot more of a yellow tone straight out of the camera. Next up with the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera, I shot this in the film profile. So this has a film and a video profile, and the video profile is more of a Rec. 709. It has a lot more contrast, a lot more saturation right out of the camera. However, the film profile is a log profile, so it's gonna be really flat out of the camera, but give the most dynamic range, the most ability to just do anything you need to in post-production with saturation, contrast, exposure, anything like that. All right, so I'm out here getting test footage right now with these three cameras. So I pretty much just have them all set up in one unit here so I can get the same footage with all three of them at the exact same time. So with all these, I'm recording the highest resolution of frame rates and pretty much the highest quality that I can with each of these three cameras. So for the FS100, that's 1080p, 24 frames a second. I believe 25 megabits per second. The Zcam E1 is DCI 4K and that's at 60 megabytes a second. And then, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera Original is 1080p ProRes 422HQ, which I'm not sure the bitrate on that, I'll put it up on the screen, but this is definitely the highest quality codec. It's 10-bit 422, while well, the other ones are just 8-bit 420. So the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera is by far the beefiest bitrate and the beefiest codec for recording video. And so you can see right here on the side, I mean, obviously the FS100 is the biggest one out of all of them. It's got all these buttons on here. Uh, it's definitely the easiest to change the settings really quick. So for example, you know, if I just want to change my shutter speed, change my ISO, anything like that, it's literally just on a switch or on a dial. And uh, these ones, you actually have to literally go into the screen. Neither of these are even touch screens, so you have to actually have to go into the menu, push through a bunch of buttons, go through the menus to switch something as simple as like the shutter speed or the ISO. The FS100, definitely a lot more ergonomic, a lot more buttons, a lot more physical dials on it a lot easier to change the settings. Also right here, you can see that I have an external battery on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. The other two, I'm using the internal battery solutions. I really wanted to use all three of these with no additions, literally just the cameras. But the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera, the battery life is so horrible with the regular batteries. I could barely get like five minutes out of a battery. So I had to put this external battery on which of course is gonna cost extra. Couldn't reliably shoot with this without an external NPF battery. But besides that, these are all just the base cameras, there's no additions on them, there's no like external recorders or anything like that. It's just what the cameras can produce. 
in camera. And the last thing before I show the test footage, uh, the lenses I'm using on these, I'm trying to get as close as I can to a 35 millimeter equivalent with all these. So on the FS100, I'm using a 23 millimeter cinema lens. And so 23 millimeters on this camera is equivalent to about 35 millimeters. And then the Z cam, I'm using a 16 millimeter cine lens. And so since this is a two times crop, that's equivalent to about 32 millimeters. And then of course on the Blackmagic cinema camera, it's a 12 millimeter, but there's a 2.88 crop factor on this sensor. And so that's also about 34 millimeters. So all these are approximately 35 millimeters. The field of views are gonna be a little bit different on all of them, uh, but it's pretty much as close as I could get. So all in all, after using these cameras for a while, testing them out, I would say if you're looking to get a camera for run and gun filmmaking, if you're looking to make YouTube videos like this and you want a dedicated cinema camera, if you're doing corporate work, if you're doing music videos, and really anything that's like more of a run and gun environment, I would recommend the Sony FS100 100% of the time. This camera is so easy just to get going. The battery life is amazing. It records good quality video straight out of the camera. It's not the sharpest, it's not the most workable codex or anything like that, but straight out of the camera, the video looks good and it's just so easy to use. So I would recommend FS100 for anything that's like run and gun, pretty much most things, I would recommend checking out this camera. However, if you're looking to buy a cinema camera specifically to make short films and narrative work where you have time to set everything up, you have time for lighting and just making everything perfect, you know, it's all scripted, you have time for everything and it's not at all like a run and gun environment, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera has the best codex and the most workable footage that you get out of the camera. And just the footage in general looks the most cinematic, like an actual film. So I would say if you're doing short films and any like narrative work, definitely look into the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera original. This camera is seriously awesome for the price and for how small it is, it records amazing video. Now, if I haven't already mentioned, I actually have videos about all three of these cameras on my channel, which I'll link below. These two I actually have reviews of, and the FS100, I have kind of a video I did a while back about a few reasons why you should buy it. I don't have a full review out this yet. If you want to see that, let me know in the comments as well, but I will link all three of these videos down in the description if you want to check them out. And even though I did recommend these two, you know, definitely still look into it more and figure out which one works best for you. But I think these two cameras are a really good place to start depending on what you need them for. So there we go, that wraps up this video. If you made it this far, please let me know in the comments because this is probably a super long video. But I really hope this helped you out and wasn't too boring. Definitely let me know in the comments if you want to see more videos with each of these cameras. And I'm actually already working on a best cinema camera under a thousand dollar video. So stay tuned for that. I can't say it'll happen soon, but I'm definitely working on it right now. And like I said, this took a long time to make. So if you could go out and hit the like button and subscribe and just leave a comment, that'd be much appreciated and it helps out a lot more than you think. But I'm not gonna rant on too much longer. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next video.